As a young girl too, she had been instructed by her mother of the necessity to always pray for grace to do the holy will of God. Following this, in a moment of spiritual awakening, Mary relates that there flashed into my mind the thought, surely God-given, that if I could but succeed in doing God's holy will always, then not only would sin be impossible, but I should always do that which was well-pleasing in his sight. This petition, she adds, became her constant prayer. These same sentiments found expression in a prayer she learned by heart when boarding in the convent in Melbourne. And I'll read it in full because it's quite beautiful. Do thou teach me an entire forgetfulness of self, O Lord, since there is no other way of entering into thee. Teach me what I must do to attain thy pure love with the desire of which thou hast inspired me. I feel in myself a great wish to please thee and a great inability to do so without a special light and assistance which I can look for only from thee. Do thou accomplish thy holy will in me, O Lord. I oppose it, I well know, but I would fain not do so. It is for thee, O divine heart, to do all. Thine alone shall be the glory of my sanctification if I become a saint. It will be greatly to thy glory. This I well know, and it is for this alone that I desire to become perfect. This prayer, she says, became her constant companion, her spiritual director. While in light of the opening of her cause of beatification, it might seem prophetic, Mary, with characteristic humility, confessed that it was only because it was part of the prayer that I said the passage beginning with the words, This alone shall be the glory of my sanctification if I become a saint. I had grown up, she says, with the idea that in order to become a saint, the first requisite was to have been born not less than 300 years ago. (laughs) Nevertheless, that prayer rose to my lips whenever I was in dilemma. And this prayer would indeed give form to Mary's life. Forgetfulness of self, openness to the will of God, Abandonment to divine providence through the acknowledgement that all things depend on his grace. Her openness to the will of God was evident in the discernment of her religious vocation. Her path to religious consecration and service of the poor in India was paved by the word of God, spoken through seemingly ordinary events. She recalls a sermon preached at St. Patrick's Cathedral here in Melbourne on Hospital Sunday after which she returned to her consulting rooms in Collins Street to find a pamphlet waiting for her concerning the pioneering work of Dr. Agnes McLaren. Dr. McLaren, a convert from Presbyterianism, felt that by studying medicine she could best satisfy her longing to follow in the footsteps of Christ who went about doing good. She therefore founded a hospital for women in northwest India and encouraged religious sisters to engage in medical work. Mary writes that it was in a spirit of curiosity that I began to read the pamphlet, but I finished it on my knees. Mary interpreted these coincidences as representing God's will for her. And in imitation of the Blessed Virgin's obedience of faith, she answered her own fiat. In a touching reference to our Lord's, to our our Lady's haste in visiting her cousin Elizabeth, Mary writes, Mine was now the privilege, I say it in all reverence, to rise up in haste and cross not the hills but the seas and carry Jesus to many a mother and child. In her deferral to the primacy of God's grace, Mary was under no illusions that she was anything more than instrumental in his hands. In a letter home written in 1928, Sister Mary offers us an insight into her prayer. A couple of weeks ago, she says, was a Sunday morning, I saw a Brahmin youth looking through the church window during Holy Mass. His attitude was not that of the usual curious spectator who turns his eyes from statue to statue and face to face. No, this youth kept his gaze fixed steadily upon the altar throughout the Mass. What does he see then? What does he feel? Thus I thought, and I breathed the prayer of the little flower, draw me. 
Mary goes on to explain this prayer of St. Therese which she made her own. She says that St. Therese prayed, draw me that we may run after you. Since if you draw me by the bonds of love, it is impossible that I should go to you alone. All those for whom I care or pray must be gathered up and drawn in that net of love. So when she had to pray for many people or many intentions, she simply simplified it all by praying just these words, draw me. Therefore, Mary adds, I being lazy and always on the lookout for easy ways of doing things, which of course is not true, decided that this is an ideal prayer. And thus I prayed for the Brahmin youth. What was my astonishment, she adds, that when a few days later I passed the side entrance of the church, near the baptismal font, I saw that same youth who was at that very moment being baptised. God is indeed good. Two years later, in a letter to her sister Eliza, we find another example of her deep spirituality. Eliza seems to have been disturbed by a dream in which she sees Mary covered with blood. Mary writes in consolation, let's turn your bad dream into a good one. July is the month of the precious blood and in this sense I heartily wish your dream might come true. Perchance our dear Lord might deign to let his precious blood flow upon me that from me it might in turn drip down upon souls. I often ask our blessed lady not to let one drop of the precious blood be wasted but to gather it up as it were in a great sponge and then pour it freely on souls. Please pray for that too, she adds. In all parts of the word there are countless souls in need of this saving bath and here in India there are 300 odd millions of them. This brings to mind uh, a a part in her many letters in which she refers to the, the many children whom she baptised, oftentimes souls and babies who are obviously in danger of death. And she would baptise them with very motherly love and care in the name of her family and of her friends. And therefore in writing to her family and friends on birthdays and other situations, she would always commend them to the prayers of these tiny souls whom she had saved and now believed were in heaven. In her prayer of abandonment to the divine will, however, and her prayer of intercession, Mary Mary clearly witnesses to her humble forgetfulness of self. For all that things seem to depend on her in the great demand of her missionary work, she was resigned to God's initiative and to his grace. Again formed by the Blessed Virgin, she realised that her part was but a preparation for God's grace and action. Our task, she writes, is but to fill the water pots, to perform our ordinary daily duties to the best of our ability, even as the waiters at the marriage feast of Cana. We leave it to him to transform our water into wine. And even though we hear him answer, my hour is not yet come, we shall keep our eyes fixed with loving confidence on our blessed mother, who has so quickly seen the need and has already whispered, there is no wine. This resignation to God's will and action would not have been necessarily easy for Sister Mary. She was ever sensitive to the great need of the people whom she served and of the great shortage of help. She dreamed of establishing hospitals and of training institutions for Catholic doctors and for more sisters to help her in her work. She was tireless in her own work, such that writing to the Glowry family on the occasion of Sister Mary's Silver Jubilee, Mother Angelina wrote, that good soul is far too busy. What fine work she does, and how much more she would do had she only the time. Although now 59 years old, she is still full of energy and zeal and acts as one of 25 years. May God give her strength to carry on still many more. Oh, we need lady doctors so badly, ones with this spirit of self-sacrifice. But for all this need and the demand upon her, Mary was not blinded to the true source of her work. Do thou accomplish thy holy will in me, O Lord, she prayed. 
It is for thee, O divine heart, to do all. And again, as we heard, our task is but to fill the water pots. We leave it to him to transform our water into wine. My dear sisters, my intention has been to show a little of how Mary Glowry lived what John Paul would later call the feminine genius. In other words, to show how she modelled her life on the Blessed Virgin and so fulfilled her vocation with the Church in humble obedience and in loving service, sensitive to what is spiritual within what is human. Mother Mary Kinnersberg of the Franciscan Missionaries of Mary, having worked closely with Sister Mary on the board of the Catholic Hospital Association in India, testifies to her great witness. She writes, due to her great humility and hidden sanctity, her capacity for giving all the credit for her success to God, her religious con congregation and her co-workers, the part Sister Mary has taken in the advancement of medical social science in this country, especially in the field of maternity and child welfare, welfare is not well known. We can now thank God that the life and holiness of Sister Mary of the Sacred Heart is now becoming known, that we have yet another witness of the feminine genius to inspire us. But in speaking of the feminine genius in history, Blessed John Paul had not meant it merely as an acknowledgement of the dignity of women, but also as a challenge. He writes, It is thus my hope, dear sisters, that you will reflect carefully on what it means to speak of the genius of women, not only in order to be able to see in this phrase a specific part of God's plan which needs to be accepted and appreciated, but also in order to let this genius be more fully expressed in the life of society as a whole, as well as in the life of the church. My dear sisters, with the help of his prayers now from heaven and of those of his queen and mother, and in drawing inspiration from the holy witness of Sister Mary of the Sacred Heart, let us take up that challenge now and by our lives of love and of service cooperate with God's grace in transforming our world. Thank you very much. <clears throat>